What's up guys, PJ here from Giant Slot Games and welcome to yet another devlog video. For those who are new here, I'm making an action adventure game with survival elements set in a procedurally generated open world. The game is inspired mainly by Terraria and Cube World. It will focus mainly on gear progression and defeating more and more powerful enemies while collecting and crafting more and more powerful armor and weapons. The game is still in its early pre-production stages, but if this sounds interesting to you, you should probably keep watching. There's a lot to cover in this video and I want to get to it, but first I quickly want to let you guys know that you can now donate via my Ko-fi page. As you know, it takes a lot of time not only to make these videos, but also to, you know, make the actual game. Right now I can only dedicate a small amount of my time to it when I'm in between freelance projects, but I'm hoping that we can find a way to make this thing actually happen together. Or maybe you just want to buy me coffee. In which case, leave me a message with which coffee I should buy and I'll buy it. I won't spend the money on art assets or anything, I promise. So check out the link in the description if you want to donate. You'll get a shout out in my next video and I'll just generally respect you a lot. Now let's get on with the video. We have devlogging to do. In this devlog, I'm going to be focusing on how I cleaned up all the technical depth that I've built up over the last few devlogs. Some of the stuff I added was really quite rushed because I wanted to get the devlogs out in time. To give you some examples, the ability system was really implemented quite badly. It really didn't provide the flexibility I needed. The way game object scripting was handled was also really bad. And the base building slash snapping system was also pretty wacky. It didn't really work all the time. Felt quite bad. Apparently, that's what you get when you want to upload monthly devlogs and you want to have something new to show every time. This is pretty much why I decided to switch it up on the channel and mix in some non-devlog videos like the previous one about game engines so that I have more time to actually work on the features and not make them suck. I did also work on a couple of other cool features that you'll have to see for yourself. I hope you enjoy. So let's talk about my mounting debt. Technical debt, that is. Not the Belgian government kind. The, bitches and the first thing that I really wanted to take a look at was game objects and scripting. Game objects in my game are basically all the things that are static in the world, like trees, rocks, walls of buildings, but also interactable objects like chests, workbenches, campfires and so on. So this is not to be confused with something like a game object in Unity. As I'm working with an ECS architecture, all of the objects that live in my world are entities, and a game object in my game is one specific entity archetype you could say. Just like a player is an archetype and a creature and a ground item and so on. If you want to know more about ECS, the Cherno has a video on it. I linked it in the description for those who are interested. So because game objects are so versatile, I needed to build some kind of scripting facility that I can use to define the behavior of specific game objects. For example, a tree needs to wiggle when you hit it, a chest needs to open an inventory UI when you interact with it, and also needs to store its content somehow. The way I had done this initially was really bad and inflexible. I essentially had an enum with game objects types like tree, rock, structure, and then in the game object system I would have like a big switch statement in the on update where I would execute some behavior depending on that type. The only way that a game object on the server could communicate with its peer on the client was through some opaque variables like state and number of charges remaining or something. And then each game object type would interpret the state to be something different. Yeah, it was kind of a mess. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote this. And while it worked for things like trees and rocks, how the hell would I even implement something like a storage chest using this? I really was not thinking ahead in this one. So to remedy this, I decided to make a more robust foundation for entity scripts. And as the name suggests, I'll also be able to use this for creatures and boss fights and stuff. More on that later. Basically how it works is there's a component called scripting component and every entity that has this, you can attach any number of scripts to. A script has access to a bunch of lifecycle callbacks and I also implemented an RPC or remote procedure call system so that server client communication becomes really trivial and scripts no longer have to deal with sending network messages manually which actually was the case before. The way it works is very similar to using RPCs in Unreal Engine, for example, but because we're using nice and clean vanilla C++ and not this custom pre-processed macro shite, we do have to let the system know which functions we would like to use in our RPCs beforehand in the constructor. But this is really easy, as you can see, you just pass a pointer to the function you want to expose to register RPC, and that's it, basically. Once we've done that, we can use server call and client call using that function pointer and pass in any additional arguments and just like magic, that function will be called on the server or on the client. And this is even type safe, you can't pass in the wrong arguments or you'll get a compile error. You don't even have to worry about marshalling the arguments. All of this just works. 
It's not, I'm not kidding. It also keeps into account the network authority of the entity. So if a client side script tries to use server call and the client doesn't have the authority over that entity, then that will simply do nothing. Before I move on, I quickly want to touch on how I handle the marshalling of the arguments because I don't know, there's probably one or two people who find that interesting. I will apologize in advance for the technical gibberish you're about to endure. Basically, most of the magic happens inside this registerRPC function, which is a variadic template function that creates an implementation of this RPC interface. And what happens inside this invoke function is that every argument is deserialized or demarshaled from the network data into a tuple. Then we use std apply to call the member function with the deserialized arguments. The marshalling itself is done by these struct templates. We have net to server, net to client, server to net, and client to net. Why do you need so many instead of just a simple serialize and deserialize? Good question. Thanks for asking. That is because for some types, the client representation is different from the server representation. So the conversion is not necessarily symmetric, if you will. Take the entity ID type, for example. The ID of an entity on the server is different from its corresponding peer on the client. When the client receives a message about a certain entity, it first needs to map that server-side entity ID to a client-side ID to address the correct entity. That's why I'm using two separate functions for serialization and deserialization. By default, if no specific specialization is provided for a type, it is simply interpreted as a plain old data structure or just a blob of memory and marshaled just like that. You really only need to create custom specializations for these marshalling functors if you are working with weird and complex types that you want to send over the network but then again that doesn't really happen very often other than a few exceptions such as strings arrays or entity ids i already mentioned in the end what i have now is a system that is really really clean to use on the front end just register the function you want to use and you're good to go basically all of the complicated stuff is mostly hidden away and taken care of in the same vein scripts also have access to script for us which are like u properties and are also replicated automatically and also use the marshalling stuff i talked about before they can also be persisted to disk automatically, so now we can implement our storage chest without any problems. Okay, I've talked enough about this, I'll shut up now, sorry. SHUT UP! Originally, I wanted to show some actual combat and maybe even a boss fight in this devlog, but getting that ready would have delayed the video a lot, and it's probably for the best given how long this video already is. What I can show you is the telegraph system. Most of the combat in the game is going to revolve around dodging various enemy attacks while trying to get your own attacks in. To facilitate this, I made the telegraph system. Every time an enemy does an attack, whether it's a basic melee attack like a bite or a claw or a big AOE attack, a telegraph will be visible on the ground to visualize where exactly that attack will land, giving you some time to move out of the way. What you're seeing on screen right now is a visualization of the player's basic melee attack with telegraphs. And while this attack does use the telegraph system behind the scenes, this is not something that you will really be able to see in the final game. I'm just using this to show you what I'm talking about since I haven't scripted in any mobs yet. That being said, for some more complex charged abilities, players will also get a visual telegraph indicator to see where it will land. The telegraphs themselves are composed of any combination of cones and rectangles, and I was surprised how many cool looking patterns you can actually get out of just cones and rectangles. Another cool thing is that telegraphs are baked into the new ability scripting system and they are super easy to use from a coding perspective. The idea is that this will allow us to create seemingly complex mob attack patterns without much effort. We don't really have to worry about doing physics queries anymore, the telegraph system will handle all of that. And as a side note, I made it so that all game objects can now also be hit by abilities as well as creatures. Before this, chopping wood or mining was kind of its own hard-coded thing. It was implemented using raycasts and it felt really bad because you kind of had to face the thing that you were mining exactly or it wouldn't register. Now it feels much better. You can hit multiple objects at the same time and gather wood from multiple trees at the same time feels much more satisfying. If you hit a tree with a sword now, you won't get any wood out of it, but you'll still see a little impact effect and the tree will wiggle a bit. I'm hoping that in the next devlog I can show all of this in action in a real combat scenario by scripting in some mob behaviors and maybe even a boss, so if you don't want to miss that, you should probably hit that sub button. 
And what's a new game devlog without some new additions to the game engine? Am I right? In order to get those telegraphs I mentioned before nicely rendered on the ground, I had to implement screen space decals. Basically, these are textures that we can project on top of other geometry in the scene. This is very useful for VFX, and I ended up using a derivative of this to implement the telegraphs. In a nutshell, the way this works is we draw a box, and for every pixel in the fragment shader, we read from the depth buffer, use that to reconstruct the world space position of the surface, which we then bring into the box's local space by multiplying with the inverse of the box's transform matrix. Now, we can simply discard fragments that lie outside of the box, and for those that lie inside, we sample our actual decal texture using the local XZ coordinate as the texture coordinate. Of course, that may vary depending on your coordinate system. If you want a more detailed explanation, I'll put an article in the description that describes the process in detail for those who are interested. The next one is also pretty cool, and it made the game look a lot better in my opinion. Have you ever wondered why the colors of my game looked a lot better in the thumbnails than in the videos themselves? No? Well, okay. Anyway, well, it's because, you guessed it, the screenshots were photoshopped, big surprise I know. More specifically, I did some color grading to make the colors pop more. Fairly standard stuff, some color balance, hue and saturation, adjust the contrast a bit. Now, what if I told you that I can carry over these adjustments into the game, and it's really simple to implement as well. Enter color lookup tables, or LUTs as they are often called. A neutral LUT looks like this. What you're seeing here is a 64 by 64 by 64 3D texture where each Z slice is laid out next to each other in this regular 2D texture. If you were to sample this texture, you'll see that for every texture coordinate, you'll see that it contains that exact coordinate as an RGB value. Basically, this texture maps one RGB value onto another, which in this case will just give you the same value back. This is a neutral LUT after all. Also, if you're wondering why we're using 64 as a dimension for our texture and not 256, that's because we can use the hardware texture filtering to interpolate between the pixels, so we don't really need to have the full range of RGB inside our texture. So now what we do is we take a screenshot of our game, we do our color grading like usual, we try to make it look as good as possible, and after that what we can do is take those adjustment layers and put them on top of the neutral LUT and then export the resulting image. Now we can load this into the engine and use it to remap the colors from the rendered frame to our color graded colors. And voila, you now have a color graded image in real time. And if you don't believe me when I said this was simple to implement, just take a look at the fragment shader code for this. It doesn't get any simpler than this. Although I must say I did screw it up the first attempt, I tried to get this working. Another small addition I made to the engine is I integrated the Steamworks SDK and added a Steam networking backend, which allows the game to communicate over Steam's relay servers for multiplayer without needing to do this pesky port forwarding or anything like that. I also added some packaging scripts and integrated the Steam Pipe tool into that, so now we can build, package, and publish the game to Steam in a single command. Very neat. And yes, that does mean the game is currently on Steam, but don't bother looking for it, it's set to private for now. One thing that I found quite remarkable is that the entire game in its package Form is currently 63 megabytes. Yes, the entire game, including all of its current assets, is 63 megabytes when it's packaged up. Like, for reference, just an empty Unreal third person starter project is 648 megabytes, more than 10 times larger. For the last edition, I noticed that as I kept adding more and more new stuff, the performance of the game has steadily declined, so I decided to do a bit of optimization here and there. I haven't gone overboard with this yet, just wanted to get the frame rate to be a little bit more steady. The most egregious sin that I've kind of been ignoring so far is that all of my static meshes, apart from the terrain, were separate draw calls. That was really bad. Luckily, the art style that I'm using comes with a characteristic that I can use to my advantage. Having the self-imposed rule of only having one color per polygon actually allows me to bake all the colors from any textures into the vertex data and then put all of the models inside of one large vertex array and then throw away the textures after that. This, combined with indirect rendering, allowed me to pretty much combine every single static model on screen into a single draw call per pass. That increased performance by a lot. Well, on the CPU at least. Also, I noticed that some of the performance loss was straight up due to bugs, like... Every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremie pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the gram meters. All of this has mostly been CPU side. You can see if I run the game inside this tiny little window, so the GPU doesn't have to do that much work, we're getting really high frame rates now with VSync off. Alright, that was it for the engine side. Now back over to the game side, you may have noticed that the player character is no longer naked. 
I took some time to model a bunch of armor pieces so I could finally show off the equipment system that I talked about in my last devlog, but wasn't quite able to show off then. The chest, belt, legs, boots and gloves are skinned meshes that are skinned to the player's skeleton, and the shoulder pads and helmet, which I don't have yet, are actually full-on visuals that are attached to a bone. Visuals are like the prefab things in my engine, in case you forgot. So that means I can add all sorts of cool effects to shoulders and helmets, like lights and particle emitters and stuff. Same goes for weapons. Initially, I wanted to unwrap all of this in a traditional way, but I was instantly reminded by how much I hate unwrapping stuff, so instead I went with a color palette texture. The cool thing about this is I can easily create recolors of any armor set just by popping in a different color palette. And that said, thank you very much for watching. Please, if you want to support the game or the channel and want to get a shout out in a future video, check out my Kofi link in the description and know that I will savor every drop of coffee that you send my way. Other than that, feel free to leave a like, comment and subscribe and check out the Discord. And thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.